So welcome everyone to the fourth exercise session of mathematical image processing. On uh, in today's exercise session, we want to talk about um, two exercises. One that stems from morph morphological uh, operations, and the other one is a little bit of preparation for what is going to come in the fifth chapter or things that you have already seen in the fifth ch chapter, which are infinite sequences. So let me jump ahead. Okay, so we have a very basic exercise on properties of morphological operations. And we want to take a look at the first one. Maybe as a recap, the basic um, operations that we know of are a dilation. I have here copied the definition that you know from the lecture, which is uh, denoted by such a um, plus sign in a circle. And it's basically, so I think the best uh, way to think about it is maybe to, to read this definition here from below uh, to up uh, to the top. So we have here a so-called Minkowski sum. So that just consists of the sums of all elements that are in set A and set B. So normally A will be our image and B will be our structure element. So, and um, well, talking about an, an image, if we uh, take the dilation with a structure element, this means like we, uh, we start with an element that is inside our image and then uh, just uh, extend this region with well, the, the shape of our structure element. The other basic operation that we have here is erosion. And erosion is um, defined as follows. So we have here a minus sign. Once again, think about A as an image and B as a structure element. And now we are looking for all the points X such that X plus B is a subset of our image A. Yeah, so in, um, in the chapter of morphological operations, normally we think about images as being sets, but you can also uh, translate this once again in the notion of images as functions uh, by taking an indicator function. open up my notes. So let's do maybe a quick example before we start looking at this um, composed operation here. So if we have an image A, so I will just mark some borders here, and we have a structure element B. Um, let me draw one that is centered in zero with blue. So let's say it's just a rectangle. And we just take out one point X of our image. Yeah, then what the uh, dilation of A by B will do, it will just add this element here to, to this one point. Yeah. So we will add every point of B to our single pixel in A. Yeah, so this would be one option. Now, if we take a look at the erosion, let's say we have a region here that is also composed of, uh, of A. So this red region belongs also to A. Then we are looking for all the points X such that our structure element B is also in here. Yeah, so um, we take a look where we can fit this image in yeah? Yeah, by just looking at the borders maybe. Yeah, we see, okay, so maybe here it does not fit anymore, so we can just move it here into this region. And then we 
always need to remember that we centered our image. Yeah. So what will remain will be maybe, hmm, let's see, a very small region only where we can where, where we can fit this image. So maybe maybe this will be the part that remains if we take the erosion here. I have also prepared something here. Okay. So now take, let's take a look at the operations that are part of this exercise, which are composed of dilation and erosion, namely closing and opening. So part B is about the closing operation. And now we want to look at the opening, which is the following. So the opening of, once again, think of A as an image and B as a structure element is First, we start off with an erosion. And in the second part, what we do with our eroded element is we do a dilation. So what is the idea of this operation? Um, so with the erosion, we do some kind of a reduction. So we uh, reduce chunks in our image that don't belong there. And um, well, of course, when we do an erosion, we will also lose some information that we uh, that we want to keep. So, in some sense, we restore our image with the um, postponed deletion here. Okay. So how do we how do we show now this part A, or maybe let me rephrase part A again for you. So just delete this this part here so what we want to show in part a is the following so if we phrase it in a sentence we want to say that every every point in the opening of a and b is also contained in A. Yeah? So A opening B is a subset of the image A. So how do we prove something like this? So we take out one element of the left set and we show it's also in the right, on the right set here in A. Yeah? So, okay, so we start with an element X that comes out of the opening. Now, so how was the opening defined? We have it here on the left hand side. So we have A eroded with B and then dilated with B again. So then I think it's a good thing if we also still are able to see the definitions here. So let me move this up a little bit, so and keep the sketch for later. So now what we are going to do is we, we are going to plug in the first definition that we have. And I already emphasized this Minkowski sum as a very practical way to look at the dilation. So we can just use definition of dilation to write the opening as a Minkowski sum of the erosion of A with B and B itself. Okay, so now if X is an element of this set here, so we have a decomposition. So we can then decompose X as follows, namely one element Y that comes from the erosion and an element B that comes from B, yeah? So where Y is an element of the erosion and B is an element of B. So, but now let's take a look at the erosion. The erosion was defined of all elements such that the Minkowski sum of this element plus B is a subset of A again. Yeah? 
Uh, so let me also copy this one. So here we have all elements, maybe let's use another letter. So all elements Z such that Z plus B is a subset of A. Okay, but now as Y is given as an element of the erosion, um, we have that Y plus B needs to be an element of Z plus B. Uh, sorry, not Z plus B, but uh, uh, of A. Yeah, because this is just the definition of uh, of the erosion. Yeah, if I add an element of B, then I need to be an element of A again. So, um, well, we can can even say more. So we have not only y plus b in a, but we have y plus b, a subset of a. So in particular, y plus small b is an element of a. Okay, but we defined y plus b to be just x. Uh, so we can decompose x as follows. So x equals y plus b. So x is an element of A. So what have we now shown? We started out with an element x of the opening of A and B, and we showed that x is an element of A. Now, but x was an arbitrary element, so we have shown that A opening with B is a subset of A. Uh, and the proof is now finished. So what we did was basically look up the definitions again and then, um, well, in this case, use the decomposition in order to show that X also fulfills all the properties that we need in order to be an element of A. So I also brought a little example where we can see how this idea of opening can be used. So let me maybe open up this a little bit and also read it. So, um, okay. So the image that I brought is an image that is a black and white image that also contains some noise. Yeah, and you see this noise in form, I hope at least you can also see it on your end, some white dots that are here in this black region of the image. So, and what we, what we want to do now is um, we want to open up this image by using a structure element that only contains once. Yeah, so the structure element that we are going to use here is um, is an image where in the discrete sense, so B is just a matrix that consists of once. So and what, what should happen now all these little white dots here that we have here, they should be um, they should, they should be deleted already from the erosion step that we have here because, um, well, these pixels are just a single ones here in the middle and we can't fit a whole a structure element B in there. So let us look, take a look at the other image here. So I hope you can see this as well. So this, this would be the result from the opening operation. Yeah? So of course, so these little black pixels still remain, but the white pixels now have been removed. So, and well, one could do the same thing with the um, inverse image. So one could now take a look at um, the complement image. Oh. 
implement. Yeah, and then do just the same operation as before. So we do an open of the complement with once. Okay, and now also here these pixels, the white pixels, they have uh, been removed. And when we concatenate those two examples that I gave you, we can remove, in fact, uh, I think almost all of these black dots here and also mostly all of the white dots that we have in there. So far for the closing and opening, well, closing, this will be uh, your homework, but the way we structured the proof uh, will be very similar. Yeah? Um, of course, the statement is different, but the, the ideas and the techniques that we use here, um, they will be the same. So, and in the end, we get a sort of a sandwiching between um, both operations. Closing makes the image a little bit bigger and opening makes it a little bit smaller. Okay, so let's jump to an entirely different um, topic, which are known vector spaces of sequences. And as you have seen already in the lecture, the spaces that we will usually consider are of the form LP of Z. Yeah, so complex sequences, and we also have a norm here. And in this exercise, what we, we want to do, um, ah, so there was a question in the chat. So let me maybe, I think as we have enough time, jump back to um, exercise 4.1 again. So the question was on how do we define the structural element size? So, um, I suppose that this um, refers to the code that I used here in order to open up the image. And um, well, this is what I did here. So I chose a structural element that some, in some sense fits to the, um, well, to the concrete problem that I'm facing here. And I am assuming that these little pixels here, they are just, those are, uh, well, isolated. Yeah, this is just one single pixel. So if if I look at, uh, so maybe let me just copy this, this out to make a little annotation here. So if I assume that this guy here is just a, a single pixel. So I also need to move this one here away. So if assume that this here is, is just one pixel, so this white portion here, yeah, then the surroundings will be just black. Okay? So if I look at this from um, the matrix point of view, my image looks like this. I have a three by three grid. I have a one or a 255, depending on um, which color space you are using, and zeros around it. So this is the situation I have in my image. And now what I'm going to, well, what I'm doing is I'm considering a structure element B that looks like this. Yeah, so this in some sense corresponds to using, um, I'm not sure if I can copy just the text here. Okay, this did not work. So I'm using here ones of three. Yeah, so this means a three by three matrix with ones in it. Yeah, and I can see already, I cannot, I cannot fit this portion or this, um, I cannot fit the structure element uh, in in my image, yeah? at least at this position not. I can, of course, fit it, for example, in here. Yeah? So if I maybe make a green drawing here, do 
this in green. No. Now, if these are three pixels, then I have here one, 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 and one here. And then I see I can fit it, this structure element, it will fit here at this point. Yeah, and so in the in the erosion step that I do, what I will get is an image that is slightly smaller here. Yeah, I'm not sure if this if these boundaries are correct, yeah, but I can I can also fit this element here, I can also fit it here. So I will I will make it a little bit smaller. And at the same time, these isolated points here, they will vanish. That's what we saw. Ah, and in the end, what I do next is I do then the deletion step to uh, enlarge my image here again. So this should work. Of course, it's just a Minkowski sum, but I do not have any pixels here like these singular pixels anymore because they have they have vanished completely. Yeah. So um, of course I used here um, a rectangle. There are also other structure elements, um, but in the end they will always be well discrete if we use it in MATLAB. Yeah? So I can also uh, use maybe something that looks like a cross here, so a three by three. something like this. Yeah, this would be like a circle structural element. Yeah, because if you think about how you would discretize a circle, um, if I just wanted three by three circle, then I will get something like this. Yeah, if I do a bigger circle, then then I will also get a, a, a bigger um, part here with ones. Yeah, something like this maybe. I have my ones here. and zeros here, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, um, of course, maybe you have already taken a look at the notes that I upload after our session. And usually uh, they have a little bit more information um, on what I write down here, because after the session, I also copy some code over there. And then you can do your own experiments with these operations. Um, yeah, and see how, how it works, yeah, how you can use it, for example, to remove um, noise of this type. Yeah. Okay, so, so once again, let us, let us start with non-vector spaces of sequences. So, and in this exercise, we want to get a little bit of intuition on what to think about when we have an two-sided infinite vector or a sequence. And I have given you already here in this equation 529 a uh, one way to look at a two-sided infinite vector. Yeah, so it's just we just count all the elements and we write them in an order. Of course I cannot write down the whole vector because it's uh, two-sided infinite. So um, I could start maybe in the middle and then once again go one step to the right, one step to the left, and two steps to the right, two steps to the left, and then write it down like this. And there are also different ways to denote the sequence. So we can either denote the sequence as, as happened here. So I start with x0, x1, x2, x3, and so on. This is what is denoted by the points. And to the left, minus 1 x minus 2, and so on, with the points to the left. Another way to denote a sequence is um, to highlight the fact that its uh, sequence is a function that maps indices to um, values, yeah? just like an array in Octave or MATLAB. Yeah? If you access an element of a vector or array in your uh, programming language, you usually use the name of the array itself, and then you just write down the argument, uh, as the index as an argument. So, uh, and this works also in a mathematical way. So we can also just denote our two-sided in infinite sequence like this. Oh, so this minus sign here, of course, does not make any sense. Uh, 
Yeah, so we can uh, fit now here uh, two different ways in order to write down a sequence, a two-sided infinite sequence. And so now we can take a look at two examples, which are very classical examples of sequences, not classical to the setting of image processing, but a good example to, to get a feel of how, how these sequences work and also how to calculate norms like this. Yeah, because sometimes what we want to do is we want to measure the, um, the content or the length of our two-sided infinite vector. And of course, if you just count the number of elements as a length, then you will always get infinite. Um, and this, this, well, this will not help us to distinguish uh, large sequences from small sequences. And therefore, we have uh, norms that are defined via sums. And um, now we want to calculate some norms for the examples given in 5.1. So let us look at the first sequence, which is EL of K. Yeah? So the sequence is called EL. And at the position K, K is our index, it is defined either one if K equals L, or it is zero if K is not equal to L. So let us do a little table here. And also for this example, let us First, start by considering the sequence E0. So we set this variable L to 0. And we will see that this is a very simple sequence, in fact. So if k equals 0, then E0 of 0 will be 1, because the number that I plug in here, the index, corresponds to the index that I have here at the lower position. So now if k equals 1, then e0 of 1 will be 0 here. Yeah? So sometimes uh, you may have also seen a notation like this with a, a Dirac delta. Yeah? So if the two indices coincide, then I'm 1. And if they are different, they are 0. So let me complete maybe some further steps here, so we have always zero here. If I'm considering an index that is different from this index that I have fixed here in the lower part. Okay, so here in the, the task, we are given L equals to two. So equals two. So E2 will look just like E0, but it will be shifted a little bit to the right. So E2 of two will be one and all the other values of our sequence will be zero. Yeah? And now you can think of how you would write down the sequence. Basically, we have done it here already. So um, you could also write that E2 equals, so 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0. And then you should maybe say that this here is for key equals 2. Yeah? So we can distinguish it. So this, this way of displaying it with a table is a little bit more precise. So how about the other sequence? The other sequence is Psi Q of K. And Psi Q of K is defined as Q to the K. If I have an index that comes from the natural numbers with zero, and it is zero else. Yeah. So how does Psi Q look like? So if I am a natural number with zero, yeah, so this will be everything right from this line that I drew here. So maybe I choose a little bit different color. So then here I will have Q to the zero, then at position one, Psi Q of one will be Q to the one, we'll have here a q to the 2 and a q to the 3. Yeah. So, and it will be 0 for all k's that are natural numbers, uh, that are not natural numbers, including 0. So, all the negative ones left from this blue line here. So, I will have zeros here. 
So of course we can also write it down a little bit different. So q to the 0 is always 1, q to the 1 is always q, and I have then here the sequence uh, 1, q, q squared, q to the 3, and so on. Okay, now what we want to do is we want to calculate the p norm of this uh, vector e2 and also of psi q for q equals to one half. So let's start with so we have the norm definition here on the left hand side. So let us calculate the p norm of e2. So by definition, so I start with this big brackets with the exponent 1 over p and then, then I take the sequence, uh, sorry, the sum over all indices n and z and then e2 of n and I plug this into the absolute value and take the uh, power to the p. Okay, now e2, at, as we saw here above, so we see it see it here, and also we see it here if we look at this line. This sequence is 0 for all indices but 1, namely for the index k equals to 2, or in this lower part here, for n equals to 2. So, if we take a look at the sum, the sum will sum up numbers that are zero most of the time and only once namely when k equals two the sum will evaluate uh, the sum and will evaluate to one so what remains here is e2 of two to the p and then i take also um, another power to one over p so these two exponents they cancel out and e2 of 2 is 1, so what I get out is 1. Yeah, so e2, the p norm of e2 is 1. And if we take a look at how these vectors are defined, they look very similar to our usual unit vectors that we know from uh, larger vector spaces. Okay, so what about psi, the p norm of psi of 1 half? So let us start maybe by writing down the formula again. So n and z, psi 1 half of n to the p, 1 over p. And then we use the same trick as before. So we know that our sequence is 0 for a, for a set of indices. In this case, it's the indices that are smaller than 0. So I just use a sum that starts at 0 and goes to infinity of psi one half of n to the p and then once again one over p. Now I can plug in the definition of our sequence psi. This means I get the sequence of uh, one half um, one half n to the p one over p. So this almost looks like a geometric series, and I have also given you here uh, the hint to recall the geometric sum formula. So what you should get is that um, if you have a number lambda that is un not equal to 1, then the geometric sum formula looks like this. Yeah, it, Lambda cannot be equal to 1 because I want to divide through it here. And in here we have a limit. And um, so in this case, what we need to do is we need to change a little bit of these exponents here, which is not a big deal. But in order to apply this formula, we need to rearrange them so the n is here outside. So what we get is 1 over 2p to the n and then here once again 1 over 2p. So now we can use the geometric sum formula or take also the limit of it 
So if n goes to infinity and lambda is smaller than 1 in its absolute value, then we get out 1 over 1 minus lambda. So in this case, if I'm not mistaken, we have here 1 over p, and we should get out something like a 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2 p here as, a, as the value of the norm of the sequence. So these are very simple examples, but I think um, so there may be the only examples where we can really calculate the norm of a, yeah, of a vector. Yeah, so because it's infinitely long, we cannot be, we really need a description that is very simple, like the, like the two definitions that I gave you here in this exercise in order to really calculate from the beginning to the end. So of course, not every sequence that we can write down um, as here also has a, has a finite norm. And I need a finite norm to be an element of one of these LP spaces. Yeah? So if I have a two norm that is smaller than infinity, then I'm in the space L2. There are also, of course, other spaces that <clears throat> we may look at. So one is the space L1 in our case. Um, we could think about a sequence x that uh, may be um, constant. So xn could be n, uh, sorry, could be 1 for all n and z. So a constant sequence. And now you can think about if you plug in a constant sequence into this formula, you will be adding once all the time. So therefore, the uh, norm of this vector here, uh, sorry, of the sequence x, so let's say the one norm in this case will be infinity. Yeah, it's, or one could say, well, that the norm is not finite. So in this case, the sequence will not be an element of L1. And in fact, it will also not be an element of any LP space uh, for P uh, strictly less than infinity. Uh, it's, we can just sum up once and then it's, it always evaluates the infinity, the norm. Maybe a little bit more interesting example would be if we considered the formula, um, if we considered the sequence xn given via uh, 1 over n for um, n in the natural numbers and 0 else then this sequence, once again, will not be in, in L1 of Z. But as you may remember from one of your calculus courses, um, this sequence will be in L2 of Z. Yeah, because I can sum up 1 over n squared for n going to infinity and get uh, a finite number here. So, and then this question also asks about the sequence y that is not in L2. We can just recycle this example here and choose yn to be 1 over the square root of n for n and n and 0 else. Okay. So one last bit of, uh, of intuition or something that, uh, that we need to, to be familiar with when we work with the sequences, is not only calculating them or calculating norms of them and looking at single vectors or single sequences, we usually also have more than one sequence at hand. And um, as you recall, maybe from your linear algebra courses, if we have vectors, we can take the sum. Yeah? And if we have infinite sequences, x and y, we can also take their sum. And I will briefly illustrate how this should look like. So if we have here our sequence x, so continued infinitely to the left and to the right, and also have a sequence y. So how does this look like? Basically the same. And I write it, write it in this way, such that we can take a talk about usual vector space operations that um, that apply here. 
So for example, what we can do is we can take a look at the sum of both of these sequences and it just works like in the finite dimensional setting. Yeah, so if you have two vectors and you take the sum, you take this sum component wise. And the same works for these infinite sequences. So we just sum up x minus 2 plus y minus 2. And then in the minus 1 component, we have x minus 1 plus y minus 1. In the 0 component, we have x0 plus y0. Then x1 plus y1, x2 plus y2. So this gets boring very fast, but it's it's an important property that we have. So we can take the sum of also infinite dimensional objects, in our case, infinite dimensional sequences. This is already our first vector space operation that we have on the space LP. The other very important operation is the scaling of a sequence with a scaling factor alpha. So as you may already have guessed from the way it works in the finite dimensional setting, this alpha here gets just multiplied with each component of our sequence. So we have alpha times x1, alpha times x minus 1, alpha times x0, and so on. So you can think about the rest. So and these two operations um, and the fact that, uh, of course, every LP space also contains the, um, the sequence zero. So that is just con consists of a, is a constant sequence of zeros here helps us to see that L1 and each LP, in fact, is a subspace of the vector space of all sequences that we have. So we have a, a vector subspace, so maybe, um, so LP offset oh, is a subspace of the space of all complex valued sequences. Yeah, this is just a mathematical way to say uh, it's safe to take the sum of two sequences and it's also safe to multiply the sequence with a scalar prefactor. Yeah. So the other thing would be to check that uh, this definition up here actually defines a norm. So do I still have my... Uh... Ah, so no, I need to take a new screenshot here, sorry. So on this space, I also have a norm, and this norm is given by the LP norm that we see here in the above part. And one could now check that all three properties of a norm are fulfilled. So I'm not going uh, to go into details here because it's basically writing down what we, uh, what we have done already in part A, but now for um, general sequences. And so looking at the first part of the norm, uh, it says that we have uh, homogeneity, meaning that if we multiply our vector x with a scalar prefactor, I can take out the scalar prefactor and um, well, separate it from the norm. I have also triangle inequality that says, well, if I take the sum of two sequences, yeah, like I did here in this part, I can estimate the sum by the norms, the individual norms of the summons here. And the third part, which is the definiteness, tells us if the norm of something is zero, then this is the case if and only if the element that I plug in is already zero. All right, so that's it for today. Um, if you have further questions, then uh, use the MetaMost chat or come to one of our help desks.